Thank you, Alice. Um, so it's really nice to be back in Princeton. Um, and it's my first official visit to the Institute for Advanced Study, although, of course, I came here a number of times when I was a graduate student in Princeton uh, 15 years ago with Elliot Lieb. But thanks to Alice and uh, Matt and Luis for uh, arranging the meeting. And I'm going um, to talk about the geometry and topology of optimal transportation. Um, so uh, in really quite different aspects than uh, we saw this morning in Cedric Villani's talk how he and John Lott and independently Carl Theodore Sturm were able to use sort of entropy convexity inequalities of the kind that I showed in flat space in my PhD thesis to characterize Ricci curvature in a geometric setting. But I think I'm going to spend about 45 minutes talking about topological aspects of the optimal transportation problem, part of which is joint work with Najma Ahmad and Hakil Kim, my former student and a uh, uh, former student of Gangbo's. Um, uh, which is mostly about extremal doubly stochastic measures on the unit square. And then I'll talk about work with two economists, Pierre-André Chiapuri and Lars Nesheim, giving a new topological condition for solutions to Kantorovich's transportation problem to be unique. And then in the last 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about geometric aspects of optimal solutions to the transportation problem, which is joint work with Jung Han Kim, who's in the audience today. So, um, so let me begin by reviewing some of what's known about uh, doubly stochastic measures and extreme points. Um, so let me remind you, if you have a convex subset K of a topological vector space, um, its extreme points, I tried to draw one here. The extreme points are indicated in red. So it's easier to say what's not an extremal point of K. So a point in K is not extremal if it can be written as a convex combination of two other points in K. And that would be true for the black points on the boundary and points in the interior. And uh, for these guys, if you try to write them as a convex combination of two other points, one of the other guys has to lie outside of K. And uh, if K is compact and convex, then if you know the extreme points, you can reconstruct the entire set K because it's the smallest compact convex thing containing the extreme points. And um, this comes up naturally in optimization problems because if you try to uh, minimize a linear or even a concave function on such a... Uh, compact convex set, then uh, the extremum will necessarily be attained at at least one of the extreme points. So for example, if I try to go as high as possible in this set K, I land on the top border. And so both of these extreme points maximize my height function. If I try to go as low as possible in K, I land somewhere down here. And so if I try to go as low as possible, I have a unique extremizer. If I try to go as high as possible, I have a non-unique extremizer, but still an extreme point. And of course, the fact, that the, uh, the fact that the function attains its minimum at the extreme points allows you to write algorithms such as the simplex method for solving linear and concave programming problems. So the optimal transportation problem that I'm going to talk about is, in fact, a kind of infinite dimensional linear program where you have some compact convex set in a high dimensional vector space. And one of the questions I'm interested in is when you slide to the bottom of the set, do you hit a face like this or do you hit a single point? Um, so let me give you some examples of interesting convex sets that you might want to understand the extreme points of. So for example, you have the n by n doubly stochastic matrices. These are uh, matrices whose columns and rows sum to 1. And uh, <coughs> for example, if you look at 3 by 3 matrices, uh, you have essentially four free variables, s, t, u, and v. And after that, the fact that the columns and the rows sum to 1 tell you the other five entries of your matrix. And uh, of course, if you want all these guys to be non-negative, that puts some constraints on S, T, U, and V besides the fact that they have to live in the unit interval. And so it turns out that this 3 this three by 3 doubly stochastic matrices form a four-dimensional convex set with six vertices. And the six vertices correspond to the identity matrix and the cyclic permutations of that where you would have ones here and a one there. And also the anti-identity matrix, where you have ones on the anti-diagonal, and the cyclic permutations of that, where you have, say, ones here and one there. And uh, so this is a special case of a theorem that's sometimes attributed to Birkhoff and von Neumann, which says if you look at the n by n matrices whose columns and rows sum to 1, that forms a compact convex set with n factorial extreme points. And the extreme points are in a, one, a bijective correspondence with permutations on n letters. So in other words, a matrix is extremal if and only if in the set here, if and only if 
it has exactly one non-zero entry in each column and one non-zero entry in each row. And shortly after proving this theorem in 1946, Birkhoff asked, what is the infinite dimensional analog? So what are the extremal doubly stochastic matrices in infinite dimensions? And uh, in order to answer that question, you should, one should say, what does one mean when one talks about doubly stochastic matrices in infinite dimensions? And there are various possible interpretations. But the one that I'm interested in is the generalization where you look at non-negative measures on the unit square, whose, which project to the horizontal axis to give you Lebesgue measure and which project to the vertical axis to give you Lebesgue measure. So, so I'm using lambda to denote Lebesgue measure. Um, I'm looking at non-negative measures gamma on the unit square such that uh, the measure of every vertical rectangle here that gamma assigns to such a vertical rectangle is the same as the Lebesgue length of the set U. And the measure that gamma assigns to every horizontal red rectangle is the same as the Lebesgue measure of the length U. And um, such measures gamma act as linear, continuous linear functionals on the space of continuous functions on the unit square. And they act continuously with respect to the soup norm on the continuous function. So this space ds infinity can be thought of as living in the dual to the Banach space of continuous functions on the square under the soup norm. And uh, because Lebesgue measure assigns unit mass to the interval, gamma must assign unit mass to the square. And so these doubly stochastic measures actually live in the unit ball of the dual space. And so uh, banach aloglus theorem tells us that actually ds infinity is a compact, uh, a compact convex set sitting in this infinite dimensional Banach space. So by the previous theorem, by the krein milman theorem, this uh, compact convex set should be the smallest such set that contains all of its extreme points. And I want to know what are the extreme points because I'm interested in minimizing or maximizing functions on this compact convex set. So actually, I'm interested in a slightly more general problem. And so let me tell you what that is. Um, <coughs> It's the optimal transportation problem of Kantorovich. And when I first learned about this problem as a graduate student, I learned about it from my advisor, Elliot Lieb, who uh, said, well, you, you have a distribution of mines over the surface of the countryside which are producing iron ore, a total of 1,000 tons per day. And you have a distribution of factories over the surface of the countryside which are consuming iron ore. And let's suppose the total consumption is also 1,000 tons per day. And you have a cost function, which tells you how much per ton it costs to move ore from a mine at location X to a factory at location Y. And um, what you want to you want to figure out how to pair the mines with the factories in order to minimize total transportation costs. And so one way to pair the mines, so, OK, so I can model this problem by thinking of the distribution of, of mines as, by being, as being given by some non-negative measure on some, let's say, complete separable metric space, and the distribution of factories by given, uh, as being given by a second non-negative measure on a complete separable metric space n. And uh, if the total production of, mine, of ore by mines is equal to the total consumption of ore by factories, then I may as well normalize these measures to be probability measures. And then in Kantorovich's formulation of the problem, what you're looking for is a joint measure gamma on the product of m cross n such that <coughs> if I project all of the mass of gamma onto the first factor m, I should see the distribution mu. And if I project all of the mass of gamma onto the second factor n, I should see the distribution nu. And so the set of all such joint measures with these prescribed marginals is, again, a compact convex set in a suitable dual space to the Lobana space. And um, <coughs> this problem formulated by Kantorovich was to look at integrating the measure gamma against the cost of shipping from x to y, and then trying to minimize that linear functional over this convex set of joint measures. And um, <coughs> so hopefully you can see why, I'm, since we know that the minimum will be attained at an extreme point of this convex set, you can understand why I'm interested in extremal, uh, extremal points. And, um, so this looks more general than the bistochastic measures on the unit square, but it's, it's really not because, um, let's say, every measure that doesn't have atoms 
on a complete separable metric space is by a measure theoretic isomorphism, so by some invertible measurable map isomorphic to Lebesgue measure on the unit square. So more or less, if you can understand the extreme points of the doubly stochastic measures on the squares, you can understand the extreme points of this set here. And in order to, so what it, one, uh, the kind of question I'm interested in is for which kind of cost functions will this minimization pick out a unique solution? And how can I understand the geometry of the solution that's picked out? And um, <coughs> so in some sense, what I would like to have is a characterization of extremality in this set in terms of the geometry and the topology of the support of the measure gamma, by which, uh, you know, I might mean the smallest closed set of full mass. Sometimes you need to look at things that are not closed, so you need to look at sets of full mass, sets whose complement carries zero outer measure for gamma. And um, somehow trying to characterize the extreme points of this set in terms of the geometry and the topology of the, the support is a problem that's been floating around for about 50 years and doesn't have an entirely satisfactory solution. Um, somehow what's hard about it is that uh, if you had a characterization so that you could look at this set and say, ah, yes, gamma is extremal if it only charges these two red lines, then such a characterization has to be invariant under every scrambling, vertical scrambling of the unit interval by your favorite uh, Lebesgue measure preserving isomorphism of the unit of interval to itself. It also has to be invariant under scrambling of the horizontal interval. And so a nice picture like this can be turned into something pretty awful by composing with horizontal and vertical Lebesgue measure preserving transformations. So on the other hand, what we do have is a nice functional analytic characterization of the extreme points of the doubly stochastic measure on the unit square that goes back to Douglas and Lindenstrauss independently in 64 and 65. Um, <coughs> and uh, so they say a non-negative measure is extremal in the space of doubly stochastic measures on the squares if and only if the set of integrable functions with respect to that measure can be decomposed as a direct sum of integrable functions with respect to Lebesgue and itself. So closure. So more or less what this means is that every function f of two variables, x and y, can be decomposed gamma almost everywhere, if and only if gamma is extremal, as a sum of functions of one variable. And I say it more or less means this because of this closure up here. What I've written here is not quite true. What's true is that every function f can be approximated by a, sequence of func by a sum of sequences of functions of one variable, and the convergence is L1 d gamma. So for every f, there exists gk and hk, such that. So this is a very nice characterization. It's beautiful because it's if and only if. Um, it's not so easy to work with because it doesn't shed so much light on what kind of sets can support an extremal doubly stochastic measure, which is the relevant question to me for the application that I have in mind. <coughs> So somehow in the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem, you looked at a matrix and you could, if, you, if every row and every column had only one non-zero entry, then it was extremal. And if that wasn't the case, it wasn't extremal. And somehow I'd like something like that. And so let me tell you what you can't. So actually, this, this infinite dimensional problem turns out to be more closely related to a slightly different discrete problem than the, than the Birkhoff von Neumann theorem, than the characterization of the extremal points in the doubly stochastic matrices. It's better to think about matrices whose columns and rows are prescribed, have prescribed sums, but which are not necessarily equal to each other. And so this comes up naturally in the context of the transportation problem. If I have two discrete measures, mu, which is made up of sum of m point masses, each of charge mi, and nu, a set of factories which are consuming iron ore consisting of n factories with the jth factory consuming nj. So now for discrete measures like this, my set gamma from an earlier slide is, 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 in, one to one, is in bijective correspondence with the set of matrices whose columns sum to mi and whose non-negative matrices whose columns sum to mi and whose rows sum to nj. And um, <coughs> So 
there's a, there's a result that says a matrix in, in this set here is extremal if and only if it's acyclic. And so I should say, what do I mean by acyclic? And again, it's easier to say what's not acyclic than what is acyclic. So a matrix is not acyclic if you can find a sequence of entries, each in a different column and row from every other entry, that are non-zero entries that are connected by a sequence of non-zero entries like this. So if all of the X's and all of the O's have non-zero entries, then this matrix is not acyclic. And it's clearly not extremal in that case either because if I add epsilon at all of the X's and I subtract epsilon at all of the O's, I haven't changed the column or row sums. And so the original matrix can be written as an average of its perturbation by epsilon and its perturbation by minus epsilon. And the converse is also true. <coughs> So analogously, a subset of the unit square will be called acyclic if you can't find a sequence of elements, x in your subset, each in a different column and row from every other x that are connected by a sequence of elements O in your subset such that you know, each O is in the column of the preceding x and the row of the following x. And um, Benish and Stepan proved in the late 80s that if you have an extremal doubly stochastic matrix, then there is a set S in the unit square which is acyclic whose complement, I mean, which contains all of the mass of gamma in the sense that its complement has zero gamma outer measure. And so this is kind of a one-way implication. If you're extremal, then there's an acyclic set that contains all of your support. And uh, unfortunately, unlike the discrete case, this theorem here is not if and only if. The converse fails. And it fails because of the following counterexample. <laughs> So take the unit square, take the graph of the function y equals x, take the graph of the function y equals x plus your favorite irrational number, mod 1. So the union of the green and the red graph is an acyclic set because if I take some point on the green graph and I connect it to a point on the red graph and then back to the green graph and then back to the red graph, such a cycle will never close because of the irrationality of root 2. So this is the union of the green and the red thing is acyclic. On the other hand, it clearly supports some non-extremal measures. So for example, there's a doubly stochastic measure whose support lies entirely on the diagonal. If you drizzle grains of sand uniformly along the diagonal, that will project to Lebesgue down here. It will project to Lebesgue over there. If you drizzle grains of sand uniformly along the red curve, that will also project to Lebesgue in each direction. So there's an extremal measure, there's a doubly stochastic measure like that. And if I take one half of the thing that's uniform along the green curve plus one half of the thing that's uniform on the red curve, I still have something that projects to Lebesgue in each direction, but it's made up of a linear combination of two things that did that as well. So it can't be extremal. So the, the green union, the red curve, Uh, is acyclic but supports non-extremal doubly stochastic measures. Uh, non-extremal non elements of ds infinity. <coughs> However, in some sense this example is pathological and, uh, and so let me try to make uh, clear in what sense it's pathological. So there's, there's a theorem of Hester and Williams that says acyclic sets S can actually be characterized in another way. Whenever you have an acyclic set S, it can be written as a numbered limb system. And they went on to use this characterization to give a partial converse to this theorem up here. So let me say what is a numbered limb system. So the definition is a little bit involved, so I'll do it on the board, but let me put it on the overhead for, uh, for those who can't see the board. Um, so 
So I want, I'm thinking about subsets of the unit square. And um, if uh, such a subset is a numbered limb system, if and only if you can decompose the horizontal axis into uh, countably many disjoint pieces, I1, I3, and I so on. I, I draw them as intervals, but they don't need to be intervals. They could be, they're just disjoint sets. And similarly, you can decompose the vertical axis into countably many disjoint pieces, which need not be intervals, but it's simpler if I draw them as intervals, I2, I0, I0, I2, I4, I and so on. And then you have a sequence of maps, fk, the kth map being defined on some subset of ik and taking values in ik minus 1. So you would have a map from i1 into i0, might look like this, a map from i2 into i1, a map from i3 into i2, a map from i4 into i3, and so on. So, such an, so if I call the green things graphs because they can be written as graphs y over x, and the orange things anti-graphs because they can be written as graphs x over y, a subset S of the square is extremal if and only if it can be written as a union of such graphs and such anti-graphs. And uh, OK, so every acyclic set can be represented using graphs and anti-graphs in this way, according to this theorem of Hester and Williams. If we, if we uh, qualify the structure of the, of the numbered limb system a little bit more uh, and call such a numbered limb system Borel, if every graph and every anti-graph by itself forms a Borel subset of the unit square, then Hester and Williams were able to prove a converse of the Benesch-Stepan theorem. They were able to show that if you have a numbered limb system and all the limbs are Borel, it's a uniqueness result. At most, one doubly stochastic measure vanishes outside that system in the sense that it assigns zero mass, the outer, zero outer measure to the complement. And uh, of course, once you have this uniqueness result, it follows as a corollary that any such measure supported on a picture like this is in fact extremal. Because if I could decompose it into two other things, those two other things would both also have to assign zero outer measure to the complement of this picture. And uh, they would have to have the same marginals, Lebesgue in each direction. And so according to this uniqueness result, they would have to be equal to each other. And uh, so you can relax the Borel hypothesis a little bit, and that's what I did in the paper with Kim and Ahmad. But you can't eliminate it altogether because of that counterexample up there. Um, and since I'm mainly interested in uniqueness in optimal transportation, and this, is, this uniqueness result here is going to be the tool that I want to use, let me sketch a proof of this direction of the theorem. And in order to sketch the proof, let me, let me call this thing, let me say this thing has n limbs if I only need capital N graphs and anti-graphs in order to represent the picture. So if I don't need a countable sequence of such things, if these guys all vanish, then I call it a numbered limb system with finitely many limbs. So if I just needed one, I would call it a, a numbered limb system with one limb, or this would be a numbered limb system with two limbs, and so on. And so how, how is this unique result, result proved? Well, it's easier to do it in the case where you have finitely many limbs. So suppose I didn't need these dots, but this was the last guy in the sequence. Now I claim that there's a unique doubly stochastic measure supported on this picture here. And I guess the picture would look a little more like this. So what would it be? Well, I'd go up here to the last, the last set in the sequence. I need to have Lebesgue measure on here. There's only one place it can come from. So there's only one way that I can drizzle very infinitely fine grains of sand along this anti-graph such that it projects to Lebesgue over here. So I know what the measure has to be here. Once I know that, I can project these grains of sand down here. I get something non-uniform. Let me subtract it from Lebesgue measure. Whatever's left over has to come from this green graph here. 
And there's only one way that I can drizzle infinitely fine grains of sand along this green graph such that they project to the non-uniform marginal I want down here. And now it proceeds by induction. Once I know what the measure is here and here, I can project these grains of sand over here. I get something. Let me subtract it from Lebesgue. Whatever Whatever's left over can only come from a unique distribution on this anti-graph. And so the whole, the whole picture fleshes out in this way. Um, in the countable case, where you have a picture like that, you appeal to the fact that you're dealing with probability measures. So they have total mass one. So if you go far out in this countable sequence, then you make an error epsilon at the top and bottom. On the remainder of the picture, what you need in order to get prescribed marginals is uniquely determined up to this error epsilon that you made. And the limit as epsilon tends to zero converges to a unique limit. It's sort of, you have a Cauchy sequence. So that's somehow the, our version of the uniqueness proof of Hester and Williams. So let me now say, what does this have to do with optimal transportation? <coughs> so the setting that I'm going to think about is the setting in which both my minds and my factories live in smooth n-dimensional manifolds, which I'll call M and N. And um, let me suppose that one of them, say the distribution of minds, is absolutely continuous in coordinates on the first manifold. And my cost function, let's take it to be a continuously differentiable function on the product space. So this tells me how much does it cost to ship ore from a mine at x to a factory at y. I want to know how to pair these guys with those guys so as to minimize the integral against this cost. And um, so, uh, I mean, I guess people like Yann Bernier first looked at the cost function, which was the square distance on Euclidean space. And they showed that the solution to Kantorovich's problem for that cost was unique. And then uh, Gangbo and myself and independent Louis, Louis Caffarelli looked at strictly, concave, strictly convex functions of x minus y and showed that the solution is again unique. And uh, building on this, Gangbo and Carlier and independently Ma Trudinger and Wong eventually wrote down a criterion of comparable generality to the one that I have here, which guarantees two things. It guarantees, first of all, that the solution to this minimization problem is uniquely attained. And secondly, it guarantees that uh, the minimizer vanishes outside a numbered limb system with just one limb, at most one limb. So under this hypothesis, which I haven't described yet, you don't need any of this picture except the first guy here. And more or less, what that means is that a priori in Kantorovich's formulation, you've, you've left yourself the flexibility that a single mine could supply many factories. But a posteriori, if this hypothesis is satisfied, what you find is that almost every mine supplies a single factory. And so you have a solution in the sense of a map from the first manifold M to the second manifold N. And that was the formulation of the problem that we saw this morning in Cedric Villani's talk, which was due to Monge in 1781. Okay, so what's the criterion? Well, the criterion is the following. It's sort of a, some, you're, you assume something topological about your cost function. And what you want to assume is that uh, for every pair of target points, y1 and y2, different from each other, um, the map or the function on the first manifold, which looks at the relative cost of shipping to y1 as opposed to shipping to y2, has no critical points. Then you get this nice conclusion here. And uh, OK, so this works beautifully for things like the quadratic distance on Euclidean space or the pth power distance on Euclidean space as long as p is bigger than 1. On the other hand, if you're trying to do transportation on a compact manifold like the sphere and you take a continuously differentiable cost, then you have no hope that this hypothesis is satisfied because this smooth function here clearly has a maximum and a minimum, so it clearly has some critical points. And so then you don't know anymore much about the solution to this problem here. And so let me uh, describe my joint work with Lars Nesheim and Pierre-André Capuri, which, uh, which gives a generalization of this theorem here to settings like the sphere. 
And uh, basically, the setup is the same. Uh, we're still dealing with a C1 cost on a product of two manifolds, and one of the measures is absolutely continuous in coordinates. And, uh, but we, we're going to modify the, uh, we're going to modify the hypothesis here by allowing for some critical points. And what kind of critical points do we allow? Well, we allow only a, global ma a single global maximum and a single global min. So if you know some Morse theory, that basically means that your manifold is topologically a sphere. This is a Morse function on it. And uh, so under this uh, relaxed hypothesis, the conclusion that you get is that this minimization problem still has a unique solution. But the optimal measure gamma doesn't need to concentrate on a, single, a graph of a single map anymore. What's true is that it concentrates on the graph of a single map and a single anti-graph. So the, the unique optimizer vanishes outside a numbered limb system, and the numbered limb system has at most two limbs. And somehow this, uh, this result is very sort of suggestive and interesting for us because, well, I can mention an open problem right off the bat. So this topological structure of a Morse function more or less tells you this manifold is a sphere. If this manifold has the topology of, say, the two-dimensional torus, I don't think anyone knows a criterion on the cost which guarantees uniqueness of solution in this minimization problem. So. And um, and what's also suggestive is that in the definition of the numbered limb system, there was lots of additional structure. You, you could have more than one graph and one anti-graph in this relation to each other. And so you might hope that if you have a manifold with more complicated topology in the sphere, but not too complicated, say the two-dimensional torus, that you might be able to find a criteria that guarantees that the solution is minimized and not that the Minimizer lives on a single graph and a single anti-graph, but maybe if, maybe if you have you know, two saddles and a max and a min, maybe two graphs and two anti-graphs is enough. I don't know. I mean, somehow there should be some connection between the Morse theory of, of, this of this function and the topology of this solution, but I can't say what it is. Um, okay. And so let me also describe what happens when you take a cost that satisfies this hypothesis in an, in an example. So, so here's, uh, here's an example that uh, I first looked at with Wilfred Gangbo, and we also discussed aspects of it in uh, these subsequent papers with Ahmad and Kim and uh, Kiapuri and Nesheim. So imagine that you have a town that's built on the boundary of a strictly convex lake, even say a circular lake. And you have a distribution. These guys are economists, so this has a nice, uh, nice interpretation. Suppose you have a distribution of students, and their residential locations are distributed around the boundary of the lake in some way that's mutually absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. But most of the students live at the south side of the lake. And uh, what you want to do is assign them to available places in schools. So you have a second distribution, which is the distribution of available places in schools. It's also mutually absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure on the boundary of the circle, but most of the places in schools are at the north side of the lake. And then you have a cost for a student at location theta of commuting to school at a location phi, maybe 1 minus the cosine. So it's minimized when the student goes to school where they live, and it's maximized when they go to school on the opposite side of the lake, and it's some smooth, some smooth monotone function in between. Um, <coughs> so Clearly, because the minimum here is attained where the, when the student goes to school where they live, everyone would like to go to school where they live, and you'd like the entire measure of gamma to concentrate along the diagonal here. But on the other hand, that's incompatible with the fact that most of the students live at the south side of the lake and most of the available places in school are at the north side. And so you somehow you have to have some mass of that measure up here in the cross of this dense part and that dense part. And the theorem tells, so cosine, cosine is a function which satisfies this hypothesis here. And so the theorem tells you that the solution is still unique. And uh, we're able to say more or less what it looks like in this example. What happens is that a certain fraction of the students, a certain uniquely specified fraction of the students at each residential location will need to commute across the lake to a school on the other side. 
And so that, uh, that gives you a certain density of your measure gamma here. And once, once you've corrected this imbalance by having this uniquely prescribed fraction of students down here commute to schools on the opposite side of the lake, the rest of the students can go to a school near where they live. And so the balance of the measure of the optimal gamma concentrates on the graph of the homeomorphism from the circle to itself. And so you have a picture like this one. It's, it's not a graph of y over x or x over y, but it is a numbered limb system consisting of one graph and one anti-graph. And you can visualize them in this way. Uh, so, so you have this picture here. Uh, this part here is the anti-graph from I2 into I1. And uh, the rest of the picture, which is to say this part here, is the graph from I1 into I0. OK. So, so I guess what I would like to do is sketch some elements of the proof of this theorem. So why is it that this, more this particular single global min and single global max for this function tells you uniqueness of the solution to the Kantorovich problem. And that's sort of the end of the topology. After I've done that, I'm going to switch to geometry for the last 15 minutes of the talk and try to tell you how can you characterize in, in a geometrical way the structure of these, uh, these sets which support optimizers. So the, the proof starts out the same way as the proof of the result of Gangbo and Carlier and Ma Trudinger and Wong. Uh, so the first thing that you want to use is the fact that you're dealing with a linear program, albeit infinite dimensional. And this, so this minimization of a linear function on a convex set has a dual maximization. And um, so the candidates in the dual func problem are integrable potentials u and v with respect to the distribution of students and schools, which satisfy this constraint that u of x plus v of y has to be less than the cost of shipping from x, of commuting from x to y. And um, so whenever you have a pair of functions u and v which satisfy this constraint, this quantity here is non-negative. If you, if you integrate it against a non-negative measure gamma, you get something non-negative. And so if gamma has mu and nu for its marginals, the integral of u against gamma gives you this thing. The integral of v against gamma gives you that thing. And so this inequality tells you that clearly the quantity on the left is bigger than the quantity on the right. Even after you minimize here and maximize there, you have an inequality that goes like that. And somehow the remarkable fact about duality in linear programming is that equality is attained when you take the min and the max. So in fact, uh, if you take a minimal gamma and a maximal u and v, then you produce equality here. And that says that all of the mass of gamma has to live on the zero set of a function, of a non-negative function like this. And so, this, so our question of trying to understand the mass of gamma is turned into a question about trying to understand the zero set of a non-negative function of the form c of x, y minus u of x minus v of y. So I will, um, so the stra we want to show gamma is unique. Our strategy is going to be take any minimizing gamma and any maximizing u and v and show that uh, the zero set here is actually one of these numbered limb systems with a single graph and a single anti-graph. And then we know there's only, by, by Hester and Williams' theorem, there's only one gamma with these marginals that can concentrate on such a set. So that's how we're going to prove uniqueness. So, um, so how does this go? Well, the constraint on u and v tells me that u of x is less than c of x, y minus v of y for all y. And so u of x is less than the infimum of that difference over y. And um, in fact, even though u is less than this infimum in general, I'm trying to maximize the integral of u against a positive measure. So I'd like to take u as large as possible subject to these constraints. And so I never, really, I never want u to be strictly less than this infimum. And I might as well replace u by this infimum, which also satisfies the, the desired constraints. So without loss of generality, I take u to be an infimum like this. And the question of interest to me is, for which y, for a given x, which y attain the infimum? Because those are exactly the y's that are going to belong to the zero set for the, for the given x. And knowing that u is an infimum of smooth functions of x like this, 
for example, if C is Lipschitz, uniformly Lipschitz, then such an infimum will also be Lipschitz. And so it tells me that U will be differentiable at least almost everywhere. So let me pick a point X naught where U actually is differentiable. And let me ask which, which points Y can attain this infimum here. So suppose I have such a point, Y1, that attains the infimum. So then I have a picture like this. And the, the red curve just touches the green curve from above at x naught. Whoops. Um, now you ask, do I, have, do I have any other point, y2, which also attains this infimum? And uh, well, I might have. So I might have a picture like the blue curve touching the green curve from above also at x naught. And um, so what does that tell me? Well, if I look at the difference of the blue curve and the red curve, that difference clearly has a critical point at x naught because I have this locally differentiable function underneath both curves at that point. And so under Gangbo and Carlier's hypothesis, if I assume that the blue curve and the red curve never has a critical point unless y1 equals y2, this picture tells me that y, has, there's a, y is a single valued function of x in the Gangbo, Carlier, Mottridin, or Wong setting. And so that's how you would prove assuming no critical points for the difference of the blue and the red curve that you have a unique solution and it lives on the graph of a map. Now in our setting, we allow critical points for the difference of the blue and the red curve. But what we insist on is that any critical point, such as this one, for the difference of the blue and the red curve, has to be either a global min or a global max. And so that tells me that either the blue curve is globally above the red curve or the blue curve is globally below the red curve. Without loss of generality, let's put it above. There could be other points, other y3, which are also tangent to the green curve from above at x naught. And then you would have a picture like this one. But because we've assumed that the, the black curve minus either the blue curve or the red curve has no critical points except global minima and global maxima, what we know is that if there is a third point like this, it lies either above the other two curves globally or between them globally or underneath them globally. So we have a picture like this. What does that mean about x naught? Well, x naught might have three images, y1, y2, and y3. But now the question I want to ask myself is, whether there are any other points x down here, which also, uh, you know, what, what other, are there other x's that correspond to this y2 and y3? Are there other x's that correspond to this y1? And the answer is that, you know, this green curve can come up and hit the red curve again. So there might be another point x, which also has y1 in its image. But because the green curve is made up as an infimum of things like the blue and the red and the black curve, it can, never rise it, it can never rise globally above the red curve again, right? Because the green curve is an infimum of things like this, it's blocked by the red curve from rising up to the level of the blue or the black curve. And so that means that y2 and y3 are alone on their rows because this green curve can never get up here again. It might get up there. And only y1 has other things on its row. And so what this shows is that y2 and y3 live on an anti-graph. There's nothing else in their rows. And only y1. y1 may live on a graph, but the range of that graph stays out of the domain of this anti-graph. And that was exactly the definition of a numbered limb system with one, one graph and one anti-graph. So this topological, more theoretic hypothesis on the cost guarantees that any minimizers of the problem lives on a graph and an anti-graph that are determined by u and v. There's only one thing that can live on such a graph and anti-graph, so the minimizer must be unique. Other questions? Yep. So it, it looks uh, like you can try to generalize, like you said, but it can maybe have some other more things. Right. Like so, work. well, so you have a saddle here, and now you know that in some directions the red curve is under the blue curve, in other directions it's above the blue curve, and now you have some conventorics to try to follow. Yeah, exactly. I haven't managed to follow them successfully. Okay, so that's more or less the end of the topology part of the talk, and so I'd like to use the remaining 15 minutes to talk a little bit about geometry. Um, and so I'd like to say what can be said about the geometry of these submanifolds of the product space which carry the mass of the optimizer in, in Kantorovich's problem.
so let me, let me focus my attention on, um, on the set of pairs x, y in the product space where the determinant of the mixed partials of the cost is non-vanishing. I mean, clearly, if you take a cost that's like constant everywhere, then anything, including product measures, is an extremizer. And this condition is satisfied generically locally. Um, for a cost like the distance squared on Euclidean space, it's satisfied globally. On a compact manifold, it can't be satisfied globally, but so it's going to have to fail somewhere if the manifolds X, M, and N are compact, but you sort of have to worry about those points separately. And um, let me use the cost function, which is a function on the product space, in order to introduce a symplectic form on the product space and a metric tensor on the product space. And so let me, the, the metric tensor, H I'll call it, in local coordinates X1 through Xn on the first manifold and Y1 through Yn on the second manifold takes this form. The X1, I mean the Xj, Xk component of H is zero and the Xk, Yk component of H is given by this non-degenerate matrix or its adjoint. Um, so because of the special form of this matrix here that it has zeros on the diagonal and these, uh, this thing in its adjoint off diagonal, this, this metric tensor can't be positive definite, so it can't be a Ramanian metric tensor, but what it can be, it's, it's non-degenerate because of this hypothesis, and it turns out to have as many time-like as space-like directions. So there's a symmetry between time-like and space-like directions. This is a signature NN metric. You could also write it this way. And um, if you, instead of having minus signs in front of both of these guys, if you take one of them to be plus and the other guy to be minus, then you turn this pseudo-metric into a symplectic form. So I'll call the symplectic form omega and the pseudometric tensor H. And so let me remind you what it means to be Lagrangian for a symplectic form omega or what it means to be space-like for a pseudometric tensor H. So if I have a submanifold of the product space and if every pair of tangent vectors P and Q to that submanifold, if their omega product with each other is zero, then this would be called an omega Lagrangian submanifold. And if every tangent vector P has a non-negative H inner product with itself, then the submanifold would be called space-like for H. And uh, if the inequality here is strict except when P is zero, then the submanifold is strictly space-like. And so uh, it's an observation of Junghan and myself that um, if you take an optimal map, at least where its support is smooth, the support is Lagrangian for the symplectic form omega and it's space-like for, uh, for the metric tensor H. And what I want to, and actually if, if you knew that the support of gamma was actually living on the graph of a function F, and if f was smooth enough, then the, the, it would be strictly space-like for h because f is, if f is a diffeomorphism, if the derivative is invertible. And somehow what I'm aiming at is that both these local conditions, omega Lagrangian and h space-like, are actually in good situations will characterize the support of an optimal measure f. And so what is a good situation? Well, it's a situation where f is a smooth enough diffeomorphism. And Trudinger and Wong, in part, partly in collaboration with Xenon Ma, have given uh, sufficient conditions under the hypothesis of Carly and Gangbo, so when the solution is a single map, to actually guarantee that f will be a diffeomorphism. So in particular, you need to, whatever these sufficient conditions are, you need to eliminate pictures like the one I've drawn here, where the optimal mapping breaks the manifold f into two pieces, a big one and a little one, because then you'd have to have a tear somewhere here where some of the mass goes to this side of the split and some of the mass goes to the other side of the split. So let me tell you what are Ma, Trudinger, and Wong's sufficient conditions from, uh, for the optimal map to exist and live on the graph of a diffeomorphism. But I'm going to re-express them in the, language of, in the geometric language that I introduced with Kim. And here they are. Um, uh, maybe it's useful to keep that up. Um, so first of all, I'm going to assume the cost is four times differentiable on this set, let's take the set to be the whole manifold for, I mean, subdomains of Rn for simplicity, because I don't want topology to get in my way. And um, <coughs> the hypothesis that rules out the possibility 
that one of the manifolds is broken into two pieces like this is precisely that uh, So I have my two manifolds x, I mean m and n. And um, if I fix some point x0 over here, I can think of the map that takes an arbitrary point y over there to the cotangent vector dx at x0, y. So this manifold ends up living in the cotangent space over here. And what I want to assume is that the image, the preimage of this manifold in the cotangent space over here is convex. That prevents it, this manifold from being broken up into several components, at least. It does more than that. So assume that set there is convex. And similarly, assume that for every y0 over here, if I look over all points here at the cotangent vectors dc of x, y0, that I get a convex subset over here in the cotangent space. And moreover, let me assume that the map that takes a point x over here to a cotangent vector there is a smooth diffeomorphism up to the boundary of this convex set. And similarly, that the map that takes a point y over here to a covector here is a smooth diffeomorphism up to the boundary of this convex set. So that's a second hypothesis. And uh, OK, and so now here's the interesting condition of Mach, Jr., and Wong. It's a con curvature condition on the pseudometric. So it says that you should um, use the pseudometric to construct a Riemannian metric tensor in the same way that you would in Riemannian geometry or in general relativity. So you have some. You have some Riemannian metric tensor uh, Rijkl, which depends on m and n. It's on m and n, and it's given by the pseudometric h. And then use that to define a notion of sectional curvature, the sectional curvature at a point x, y of a tangent plane p, q should be the contraction of this thing with p, i, p, k, q, j, q, l. And normally when you're defining sectional curvature, you would divide this by the magnitude of p wedge q. But since I'm not dealing with a positive definite metric, I don't want to divide this by anything because I don't want a zero denominator. So the sectional curvature that I'm defining, it has a well-defined sign, positive, negative, or zero. It doesn't have a well-defined magnitude in the usual sense of sectional curvature. And uh, so the, the, the last key hypothesis is assume that this sectional curvature is non-negative for every, for every, so this is now an assumption, assume that this is non-negative for every horizontal vector p of the form p plus zero and vertical vector q of the form zero plus q in my product space m cross n. So here's p plus 0, here's 0 plus q, such that these two things are h orthogonal with respect to each other. So assume this thing here. Under those hypotheses, what, uh, what Trudinger and Wong were eventually able to prove was that uh, assuming mu and nu have smooth positive densities, the unique optimal measure actually lives on the graph of a smooth map from m to n. And uh, under the very same hypothesis, what Kim and I were able to show was that the omega Lagrangian and h space likeness of the optimal measure actually characterizes optimality. So if you can find a diffeomorphism such that, such that its graph is omega Lagrangian and h space like, then, in fact, it's optimal for the cost c. So any measure gamma which lives on the graph of such a diffeomorphism is, in fact, optimal. So more or less, we're arriving at the end of my talk. Um, so it was sort of a, it was an interesting surprise for us that uh, the, the conditions that guarantee this, or the conditions of Ma, Trudinger, and Wang that guarantee smoothness, turn out to be related to the pseudometric tensor h primarily the Lagrangian form omega. But a posteriori, we sort of understand this from the point of view that uh, if we're asking a question like, when I find the optimizer in this problem, does it live on the graph of a smooth diffeomorphism? We're asking a coordinate independent question. So if the diffeomorphism is smooth in one set of coordinates on the manifolds M and M, it's smooth in all sets of coordinates. And so the answer to this question, if, if you can find a necessary and sufficient condition, 
uh, for this thing to live on the graph of a diffeomorphism, then that necessary and sufficient condition ought to be expressed in terms of geometrical quantities, and that's what the pseudometric tensor H and its curvatures and the Lagrangian, uh, the symplectic form omega are giving you. They're giving you invariant quantities that are determining the smoothness of this map. Um, so more or less pseudo-Ramanian geometry is arising here for the same reason that it arises in general relativity, that somehow the coordinate independence of the question you're asking force you to force the answer to be couched in geometric terms. And I should say that uh, these, given A0, A1, and A2, A3 weak is actually necessary and sufficient at least for continuity of F because Gregoire Lopère has constructed, shows that as soon as, as soon as you have a negativity of this tensor at some point in some pair of directions, then you can construct smooth bounded data mu and nu such that the optimal mapping from mu to nu has a discontinuity in it. So uh, somehow this, this condition is, is necessary as well as sufficient given the other hypotheses. And so you ought to get a geometrically invariant answer. And I can also say Grégoire Lopère showed that um, if you have strict positivity of this quantity here, then, um, then even if the data are not so smooth, as Trudinger and Wong assume, if they're just bo bounded away from, have densities which are bounded away from zero and infinity, the optimal map being between them will still be continuous and it will still have some holder exponent. And the holder exponent in Lopère's work is rather explicit. Uh, it's the minimum of one fifth and one over four dimension minus one, something like that. Max or min, uh, whichever is worse. Um, and Somehow, the, so the, but to get this Holder exponent, he needs to assume strict sort of uniform positivity of this quantity here. And uh, from that point of view, it was sort of satisfying for us that the, the quantity that's coming in is actually scale invariant because I wasn't able to normalize this by any kind of magnitude of P and Q. If this curvature had a length scale associated with us, it would be telling us something about the Holder constant in Lopère's estimate. And the Holder constant has to depend on coordinates. I mean, the exponent is coordinate independent, but the constant isn't. And so we were happy to see pseudo-Ramanian geometry rather than Ramanian geometry governing the smoothness of this, uh, this, these solutions to the elliptic equations which solve this variational problem. So maybe that's a good place for me to stop. <laughs>